everyone. Welcome to Chesapeake Baptist Church for the early bird service. Let's all stand, everyone standing. Take your song books in the pews. Go to song number 247. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Song number 247. Saved by the blood. Song 247. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. John Hamblin with us, praise the Lord, and uh, first time at our church, and uh, we're in for a treat of preaching and the preaching of God's Word, and I'm thankful that you're here this morning. Let's open the service in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you, and we sing that song, Glory, I'm Saved, and we thank you, Lord, for our salvation, dying on the cross for our sins and giving us the gift of eternal life. Help us to never lose that joy and that remembrance of what you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for this morning's service. Thank you for allowing us to have the preacher here today. And Lord, I pray that you work in our hearts. And Lord, just uh, help us to have a service that honors you in everything we do. We love you, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen.
take your bulletin out, if you will. If you need a bulletin, raise your hand. And uh, oh, you look at the bottom of that first page, and ushers are doing a good job, doing a great job. The bottom of that first page, our spring revival is here. Can you believe it's here already? And uh, praise the Lord, we're having services, revival services tonight, uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, dinner on the grounds at 6 o'clock. Farm fresh chicken is tomorrow. That's, you don't have to say anything else, farm fresh chicken. And uh, some people don't believe that farm fresh chicken is a real thing. Miss Diane, it's still around. And uh, praise the Lord. Thank you for ordering that for us. It's a blessing. And uh, boy, it's going to be great revival services. Tonight, uh, evangelist John Hamblin will be with us. But this uh, is a book he wrote, Shipwrecked. And it's truths from the uh, sinking of the Titanic and uh, the anniversary of that. And everybody who comes tonight will get a copy of this book signed, and that'll be a blessing to you. And then I have another interesting book right here, Essentials of Evangelism. This is a hard book to get a hold of. And uh, back in 1979, when evangelist uh, John Hamblin was 17 years of age, he got saved in September. Two weeks after he got saved, he was called to preach. Uh, 30 days after he got saved, he began to preach his first revival meetings. And then there was a man named Tom Malone at a big church in Pontiac, Michigan, a big uh, college there. They were having a preacher's uh, preacher boy contest, and uh, they uh, he entered. He'd just been saved for a couple of months. He won the preacher boy conference and got to preach with Tom Malone at the age of 17, which developed a relationship with Dr. Tom Malone through the years, preaching with him, Tom Malone mentoring him. And this book right here, Essentials of Evangelism, were lectures that Tom Malone preached way, way, way back, I believe in 1958, uh, at Bob Jones uh, College or Bob Jones University. And I have about five of these books, and if you bring a visitor uh, to the revival on Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, uh, you just ask me, and the first five people that bring a visitor, I'll give this book, and uh, that'll be fantastic. Then I also have 10 copies of Tom Malone's autobiography and the preacher from Pontiac. And if you bring a visitor, you can choose one of those books, whether that one or this one, it'll be a blessing. It's gonna be a fantastic revival. And uh, clear your schedule, call in sick to work, everything, just come, amen? Uh, look at the next page, if you will. Uh, Churchwide soul winning. Our missionary of the week is the Shrivenoff family. And I wanna say thank you for you folks going to our website, uh, pushing the link and then sending them a mission message. You not only pray for them, but you encourage our missionaries. And then if you want to get some good music, go to our Chesapeake Baptist uh, YouTube page. There's hundreds of songs that were sung here at our church right there. You could push play and listen to that probably for almost 24 hours. There's so many songs on there. Good music and a blessing right there. Brother Mike, come lead us in song if you will. Let's all stand together, song number 579, The Lily of the Valley, song 579. Everyone standing, everyone singing, song 579. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's a very certain thousand to my soul. The Hey, 
welcome the people around you. It's good to see the Rouches, and what a blessing. And then Sister Forbes, good to see your daughter back with you for a couple of I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I appreciate your faithfulness to giving. Brother Sean hears the gospel all around Hampton Roads. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Spirit, that our ears would be attentive, that our eyes would be to break it up, that it may be able to receive seed, that it may be able to go down deep with the roots, that we may be able to bring forth fruit. Things we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Bye. 
a brand new line. Change my direction. Change my direction. Wash away all my strife. I'm a newborn believer. I'm a newborn believer. It's a holy and filly. It's a holy and filly. My lords are getting brighter. My days are getting brighter. I just started living. If I had all boldness. In this world below, I'd be covered with trouble. There'd be no place to go. But when I met Jesus and I started believing, I got filled with His love, was cleansed by His blood. I just started living. I just started living. I found me a brand new life. Change my direction. Change my direction. Wash away all my strife. I'm a newborn believer. I'm a newborn believer. It's a holy and filly. It's a holy and filly. My lords are getting brighter. My days are getting brighter. I just started living. Don't you look at me funny. You old prophet of doom See I'm not one bit discouraged And I'm feeling no gloom Cause I've got the spirit And it's totally thrilling I've given up on counting Got no time for doubting I just started living Oh I just started living I found me a brand new life. Changed my direction. Changed my direction. Washed away all my strife. I'm a newborn believer. I'm a newborn believer. It's a holy and filly. It's a holy and filly. My lords are getting lighter. My days are getting brighter. I just started living. My lords are getting lighter. My days are getting brighter. I just started living. I just started living. Hey, man, that was good music. We're going to get right to the preaching of God's word. And uh, praise the Lord. Let's welcome evangelist John Hamblin. And praise the Lord. Thank you, preacher. Appreciate it. Open your Bibles, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. It is a wonderful joy and blessing to be here at the Chesapeake Baptist Church in Chesapeake, Virginia, for this spring revival meeting. I had the privilege uh, some years ago in having uh, the opportunity of meeting your pastor and my new friend, Brother Matt Nettesheim, and I believe that God knitted our hearts together. Uh, these days have been in my calendar for a good while, and I've been anxious and anticipating being with you. Let me say right uh, out the gate, God is in the revival business. Amen. And what he's done in the past and on the pages of the Bible, he's interested in doing in the present. Revival is not something that's promoted up. Revival is something that's prayed down. And I'm just uh, excited to be here, and I'm uh, looking forward to the eternal work that God's going to do in each and every one of our hearts in these days that have been set aside for revival. Uh, we've been on the revival road now uh, 41 uh, plus years. This September will mark uh, 42 years. And uh, as we've been on the revival road, I've made some observations, and an observation that I've made in what makes for a great meeting is two things. Number one, participation. Amen. Participation makes for a great meeting. Uh, that's, uh, that's your part. And you participate by praying. You participate by coming. You participate by bringing people with you. So I've learned in these uh, 40 uh, plus years of being on the revival road, that it takes uh, participation to have a great meeting. Amen. The second thing that I've discovered, and it's more on my part than it is yours, it takes uh, perspiration to have a great meeting. 
if I get perspiring while I'm preaching, ah, oh, the meeting's on and God is doing some great things. And so I want to encourage you to be back tonight at, uh, I believe, 6 o'clock and then Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. I'll make a statement that you'll find hard to believe, but if the Lord should stay His coming, it'll be like we've just turned around and here it is, Wednesday night, the last message will have been preached. The invitation will have been given. We'll have closed in prayer and have gone our separate ways. And this meeting, these services, well, it'll be in the annals of time. And so you don't want to miss a single, you don't want to miss a single service. I mean, if you're a member of the Chesapeake Baptist Church in Chesapeake, Virginia, then I hope already You've wiped your calendar clean. Whatever it is that you're planning to do, if it's not revival, put it off. Amen. Just put it off. If you're planning on, I don't know, killing someone, stealing a car, robbing a bank, writing a bad check, backsliding, wait till Thursday. Just wait till Thursday. And don't let anything stand in your way of being in the revival meeting. I so appreciate the choir that uh, sang this morning and uh, the ladies, uh, I believe it was a trio uh, that sang and the Nettesheim family that sang a moment ago. Gospel of Luke chapter 16 and I'll take but one verse of scripture for our text and it will be verse number 23. Gospel of Luke chapter 16 and verse number 23. And I would invite you to stand with me as I read the Word of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, and verse number 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. A little phrase in this verse that I would call, oh, oh your attention to, and it's the phrase, and in hell he lift up his eyes. Do you see it? There it is, and in hell he lift up his eyes. And for a few moments, I want to speak to you on the subject this morning, what you'll surely believe, your first five seconds burning in hell. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this privilege to stand behind a sacred desk to preach the Word of God. If in my heart I want to be a blessing, but the only way that I can be is if you hide me behind the cross and fill me with the Spirit. Place a hedge around this great church by the blood of Christ to keep the devil and his demons from hindering this service. Save the sinner and stir the saint. Heavenly Father, for all that you'll do in our midst and even in our hearts this morning, we will be careful to give you all the praise and honor and glory. Bless and protect my precious family as I am away. Give us fresh, warm bread from the oven of heaven to feed from, <coughs> to feed from this morning. And Lord, I'd request, oh, how I would request that you'd clothe me in my calling. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, and for his sake, amen. You may be seated. As strange as it may sound, there's not a single disbeliever, doubting Thomas, or dissenter in all of the unseen world of debauched souls. Nobody in hell laughs or lampoons a singular doctrine off of the sacred pages of the Word of God. In fact, a person may have proudly called themselves 
a free thinker here who in the hereafter will there uh, positively call themselves a fundamentalist. What you'll surely believe, your first five seconds burning in hell. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 16, we find the lovely Lord Jesus Christ speaks of two rich men. Now this chapter could be easily or effortlessly outlined like this, the rich man and the steward, verses 1 through 18. And the rich man and the street beggar, verses 19 through 31. It is well the physician Luke is dealing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit with the rich man and the street beggar that a person learns what every sinner believes their first five seconds blazing in hell. Verse 23, and in hell he lift up his eyes. Everyone, Brother Nettishine, knows that seconds may seem a very small measure of time. But an individual can fall in love in one-fifth of a second. A honeybee flaps its wings 600 times in, in three seconds. Bill Gates can make about $500 in five seconds. And the sinner in the charred halls of hell becomes a genuine Bible believer within seconds of their startling and shocking entrance. Never forget, it only takes the teeniest increment of time inside the gates of perdition to get any person to testify that their previously held tenants were grossly inaccurate. Now, if you miss everything that I preached this morning, oh, I pray that you would not miss that. And it even bears repeating, it only, it only, it only takes the teeniest increment of time inside the gates of perdition to get any person to testify that their previously held tenants were grossly inaccurate. Friend, you and I, both the unsaved and the saved, need to know what everyone instantaneously believes when they open their eyes in hell. Now quickly this morning, there are three heart-moving truths people believe in hell after only being there a few seconds. Let's quickly notice it as it's found in Luke chapter 16. What you'll surely believe, your first five seconds burning in hell. Number one, a real place. Verse 23, and in hell... He lift up his eyes. A heart-moving truth that people that believe in hell after only being there for a few seconds is it is a real place. In verse 23, the physician Luke tells us that the lovely Lord Jesus Christ makes it crystal clear that the forever home of lost souls is an actual location. An individual must keep in mind that when the Son of God had fall from his lips, the conjunction and, the preposition in, and the noun hell, he was letting, Brother Nettishine, everyone know for time and eternity that this wasn't a figment of some crazed preacher's imagination or a fairy tale of some clever person's invention. Uh, please uh, listen closely to the testimony of the rich man in regards to this being a recognized spot. Verse 28, lest thou also come into this place of torment. The poet put it like this, hell, the prison house of despair. Here are some things that won't be there. No flowers will bloom on the banks of hell. No beauties of nature we love so well. No comfort of home, music, uh, and song. No friendship of joy will be found in that throng. No children to brighten the long, weary night. 
no love, nor peace, not one ray of light. No blood-washed soul with face beaming bright. No loving smile in that region of night. No mercy, no pity, a pardon, nor grace, no water. Oh God, what a terrible place. The pangs of the lost, no human can tell. Not one moment's ease. There's no rest in hell. Friend, you and I need to know that what everyone instantaneously believes when they open their eyes in hell is uh, it's a real place. The Bible says in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast in to hell. Breaking news, just as every person has a temporal nailing address, one who steps out into a crisis eternity has an eternal mailing address, uh, which is 666, uh, six, six, forever to be lost boulevard, lake of fire. You see, if you go to a map, you can find on that map Chesapeake, Virginia. And as we go to the Word of God, we can find in the map of the Word of God uh, the location, uh, uh, the address of the spot of hell. And what someone believes, uh, just as soon as they arrive in hell, uh, they don't have to be convinced. Uh, they don't have to be won over. Uh, they don't have to be uh, made certain uh, within seconds uh, of arriving in hell. What they learn is uh, it's a real place. On May 22nd, 2020, a Chicago inmate escaped jail by swapping places with another detain detainee and wearing a coronavirus mask so nobody saw his face tattoos. Jaquez Scott left the Cook County Jail instead of Quentin Henderson, who had been approved for release that day. Henderson later told authorities that Jaquez uh, promised him $1,000 to swap to their swap, swap places. Scott wore a Henderson sweatshirt and a mask to take Henderson place. Henderson's place when he was called up to leave. And that's how he made his escape from the slammer. Ladies and gentlemen, I've come to this pulpit in this hour to let all those know who are under the sound of my voice uh, that there isn't a trick, mask, uh, or ploy that you could ever come up with that's going to get you out of hell's hooska. Oh, once you've landed there, you see when people land in hell, they immediately believe, immediately believe it's a real place. Number two, let me hasten. Still in Luke chapter 16, number two, a real pain. Look at it, verse 24, for I am tormented in this flame. A heart moving truth that people will believe in hell after only being there a few seconds is it's a real pain. In verse 24, the physician Luke tells us that the lovely Lord Jesus Christ makes it crystal clear that the forever home of lost souls has, don't miss it, actual acute suffering. Dr. John R. Rice once wrote about this scene in the scriptures, there was no hesitation. He went on to write, the body is not cold, but he's in the torments of hell. Before the expensive funeral and the mourning of rich friends and the eulogy, the rich man was already being tormented in the flames. And then <coughs> Dr. Rice uh, ties up his thought, <coughs> excuse me, ties up his thought by writing, God does not have to wait until judgment time to know that the sinner is unrepentant, unconverted, unforgiven. Friend, you and I need to know that everyone instantaneously believes when they open their eyes in hell, it's a real pain. Now, there are five senses. And Brother Nesheim, I don't know through the years how many times I've preached from Luke chapter 16, but it's been more than I could count. And it wasn't until when preparing this very message that it dawned on me 
after preaching on hell many, many, many times, it dawned on me that all five senses that people have here, they'll have in hell if they're lost. Now that may shock you. That may stun you. That that may surprise you. But all five senses uh, that people have on this side of the door of death, if they're lost, they'll take with them into a crisis eternity. And we see it from the testimony of the rich man. Uh, First of all, uh, his sight. Verse 23, and in hell he lift up his eyes. A sense that human beings have here uh, that they'll sadly find uh, uh, suffering in hell as seen from the rich man's own story is his sight. Just five minutes uh, in the lower world with the sinner's eyes wide open uh, will there foster five millennium of hair-raising nightmares. His sight. Secondly, his taste. Verse 24, and cool my tongue, a sense that human beings have here that they'll sadly find suffering in hell as seen from the rich man's own story is his taste. Even water bottled at the source of a third world country sewer department would carry a large price tag in hell. You say, preacher, you're not fooling me. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to scare me. Congratulations. Because I'd rather have you hell scared than to have you hell scorched. You see a sense uh, that someone has here that if they're lost, uh, they will take with them in to the hereafter uh, is uh, a taste. Uh, Thirdly, his touch. Verse 24, for I am tormented in this flame. Uh, A sense uh, that human beings have here uh, that they'll sadly find suffering in hell as seen from the rich man's own story is uh, his touch. Uh, Every nerve in will feel the lick of every flame as the unbeliever burns in the bowels of the earth. His touch. Number four is hearing. Verse 25, but Abraham said, a sense uh, that human beings have here that they'll sadly find suffering in hell (coughs) as seen uh, from the rich man's own uh, uh, story is... uh, his hearing, listening uh, to the screams uh, of the last person who just arrived in hell, mingled and mixed together with those people who've already been there for centuries would fill every insane asylum on earth. His hearing. And then number five, his smell. Verse 28, lest thou also come in to this place of torment. A sense uh, that human beings have here that they'll sadly find suffering in hell as seen from the rich man's own story is uh, his smell. Maybe, Brother Nedeshaim, of the nauseating smell of burning flesh uh, times a hundred thousand will be what they call a good uh, uh, AQI air quality index uh, day in perdition. Uh, His smell, all that every person that is in this service uh, uh, and maybe watching online uh, would there realize that five senses that human beings have here that they'll sadly there uh, find suffering in hell uh, are sight, uh, uh, taste, uh, touch, uh, hearing, and smell. Apparatus 126 is the oldest known surviving motorized vehicles from the Seattle Fire Department. The 1913 Seagrave 55 foot a city service ladder truck with a 40 gallon chemical tank was delivered to the firehouse uh, on October 24th, 1913 uh, at a cost of $6,550. It was replacing uh, the horse drawn ladder truck. For 55 years, five months, 
uh, and uh, 29 days, this oldest fire truck uh, raced uh, around the city of Seattle, putting out all sizes of fires uh, and rescuing uh, hundreds of people. But wait just a minute, if it were even possible uh, to park one million apparatus uh, 126s in the center of downtown hell and let them work for one million years, they still wouldn't be able to lower the temperature not even a half a degree. And what people believe in hell after only being there for seconds is a real pain. And then number three and last of all, not only a real place and a real pain, but number three and last of all, a real prayer. Verses 27 and 28, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. A heart-moving truth that people believe in hell after only being there for a few seconds is, uh, it's a real prayer. In verses 27 and 28, the physician Luke tells us that the lovely Lord Jesus Christ makes it crystal clear that the forever home of lost souls has actual seasons, oh my, of supplication. Evangelist Oliver B. Green once said, about this spot in the scriptures, the word of God is a fence around hell to keep you out. That's 100% true. But hear me and hear me well this morning. There's another wall. There is another fence. There is another barrier that God in His goodness and grace uh, has put up uh, to keep you from dying uh, and going to hell. And that is the prayers of those who already are there. Think about it. The only religion thing they do in hell. They don't read the Bible in hell. They don't go to church in hell. They don't pass out gospel tracts in hell. They don't don't talk about the Lord in hell. But Dr. Nettesheim, the only, the only, the only religious thing uh, that they ever do in hell is to have a prayer meeting in hell uh, that the next uh, family gathering uh, won't assemble in hell. And right now, this very moment, Right at this tick of the clock, there is somebody, if you're lost in hell, that knows you uh, and you know them and they're praying right now for you. If it were possible uh, to take uh, uh, this wireless uh, microphone and hang it over hell, right now you would hear someone who you know and knows you and they're praying in hell right now. They're calling your name and they're saying, stay away, get saved, and uh, and don't come. Let me say it again. The only religious thing they ever do in hell is have a prayer meeting that their loved ones wouldn't gather there for the next family reunion. Friend, you and I need to know that what everyone instantaneously believes when they open their eyes in hell is it's a real Prayer, the Bible says in Matthew 21, 13, and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Pardon me, but shame on those of us that have allowed the prayer meeting at the house of God to be neglected, rushed through, and basically treated as an awkward formality 
because outside of the church sign it says prayer meeting well the whole time uh, there is a prayer meeting uh, that never stops uh, that sinners would be reached uh, with the soul saving gospel I mean in hell they're praying that you and I that are saved uh, would get off the stool of do nothing and quit whittling at the stick of do less uh, and win their family to Christ A constant and a continuous prayer meeting. A constant and continuous prayer meeting. Praying right now for those of you that are lost, that you would trust Christ and be saved. I'm closing with this. Five men were entrapped in a spar and zinc mine by the Nettesheim in Salem, Kentucky by falling rocks. They had nothing to eat. They were in utter darkness. One of the men could have saved himself had he not run back to warn others. When the entombed men discovered that they could not escape, they began to pray and sing their prayer and praise service oh my lasted for 53 hours. When they were rescued, later one of the men testified, we lay there from Friday morning till Sunday morning. We prayed without ceasing. When the rescuers reached us, we were still praying. When the men were brought out of the mine on their caps, uh, uh, each one had scrawled these words, if we're dead, when you find us, we are all saved. Don't miss this. I can promise you, on the authority of the Word of God, I can promise you that on the authority of of the Word of God that for the last 53 hours from Friday morning all the way to this morning there's been a prayer meeting that's been going on in hell and somebody who knows you and somebody you know has been praying for you that you might trust Christ and be saved. Would you please look back at our text Luke 16, 23, and in hell he lift up his eyes. No debate now. No distrust now. No disbelief now. No uh, disagreement now. And once someone arrives in hell, They may have called themselves proudly uh, a a free thinker here and the hereafter they will powerfully say I believe every word of that Bible but it'll be too late for them. It's not too late for you. What you'll surely believe Your first five seconds burning in hell. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. In this service this morning, there are two kinds of people. Those that are saved and those that are lost. I did not say those that were Baptists and those that were not Baptists. I said those that were saved and those that were lost. No one goes to heaven because of their religion. One goes to heaven because they've received the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I wonder who would lift their hand and say, Preacher, I know that I know that I know that I know if I were to die right now, heaven is my eternal home and I'm saved and sure. You'd lift your hand and leave it saved and sure. Saved and sure. Saved and sure. Thank you. You may put them down. You're here this morning and you 
couldn't raise your hand, but you would lift it now and say, Preacher, I need to be saved. I need to trust Christ. I, I, I don't want to die and go to a devil's hell. And you'd lift your hand right now. I won't embarrass you. I'm not wired that way. But I sure want to pray for you. And you'd lift your hand and say, Preacher, I need to be saved. I, I couldn't raise my hand a moment ago, but I, I, I will lift it now and pray for me. I need to trust Christ. And Brother Nettesheim, I, I can't think of any, any sane person, not a sane person that would want to die and go to hell. Not a sane person. And you lift your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. I need to be saved. I need to trust Christ. I, I couldn't raise my hand a moment ago, but, but I would lift it now. I, I need to be saved. Preacher, pray for me. You're here this morning, and as a Christian, somewhere along the message, God spoke to your heart. And you'd raise your hand and say, Preacher, as a believer, I sure haven't been the witness I ought to be. It's been a long time since I passed out a gospel track. I, 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 it's been a long time since I had that burden to see others saved. And you'd lift your hand and say, Preacher, I, I need to get back to witnessing and being a personal soul winner. God bless you there and there and all over the house, all over the house. Preacher, I've lost my burden. I need to get my burden back. It was Charles Finney, Brother Nettesheim, who said we'll have revival when Mr. Dry Eye becomes Mr. Wet Eye. Maybe you're here and you'll have to forgive me. I don't know how to put it any other way. But you're here this morning and you just need old-fashioned get right with God as a believer. And you say, preacher, that's me. God bless you there. Others, I need to get right with God. Preacher, God bless you there and there all over the house. Thank God for honest people. I can't think of anything like the doctrine of hell that would cause the Christian to get right with God. Not because we're going there. We're not going there. We're saved. But we sure don't want anybody to stumble over our, par, our poor testimony and land in hell. We stand to our feet. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, thank you for the kind attention of these, my brothers and sisters. And Lord, I pray that not one in any way would grieve, resist, or quench the Holy Ghost. May this be a time of great and glorious victory in Jesus' name. As Brother Nettishine begins to play and our sister begins to play, with heads bowed and eyes closed, these altars are open. Right now, would you come? Right now, would you come? What you'll surely believe your first five seconds burning in hell. A real place. A real pain. A real prayer. There's probably some here this morning that you want to be saved. You do. But this is all new to you. All new to you. And, and maybe you've never been in a service like this, church like this, but you know in your heart of hearts you need to be saved. You know you do. You just don't know what to do. But a song leader, we've all been there. All of us have been there. For me, it was nearly 42 years ago. When after a message just like this, I stepped out during the invitation. At Nettesheim, I was on the third row, right-hand side of the pulpit. Would have been the uh, piano side. I stepped out during the invitation. And I trusted Christ. I want to make it as easy as I can on people to get saved. I don't want to make it hard. I don't want to make it difficult. 
So as the musicians play with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you know you're lost and you want to be saved, I'd be so honored to pray with you. And you can pray right where you're at. Say, preacher, how can one be saved? Realize you're lost. Brother Nettishine, that doesn't mean that anyone comes to us and gives us a long laundry list of things that they've done that's wrong. No, that doesn't mean that at all. It just simply means that when the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, you simply say in your heart, amen, that's me. You realize you're a sinner. You recognize that Jesus, God's son, lived a sinless life, went to an old rugged cross, shed his blood, laid down his life, and triumphantly rose again from the dead. Don't miss this. Jesus is not a martyr. They did not murder Jesus. Jesus is a savior. He laid down his life. And then three days later, triumphantly rose again from the dead. Now the third thing is the most important thing, and that's where you receive Christ. Most song leader, I love to read in the four gospels how simple Jesus makes salvation. In one place, he calls salvation water. In another place, he calls it a door. In another place, he calls it bread. What do you do with water? You take and drink it. What do you do with the door? You step through it. What do you do with bread? You take and eat it. And for you to be saved, it's this simple. You open your heart's door and invite Jesus in. You can do that right where you're standing. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you've never done that, would you this morning pray with me? Opening your heart's door and inviting Jesus to come in. Would you pray with me, Heavenly Father? Are you praying? I believe what the Bible says about me is true. I'm a sinner. And right now, I believe that Jesus is the Savior. And I ask Him to come into my heart and save me. Thank you for salvation and help me to live for you in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You'd say, preacher, that's what I just did. For the first time, I opened my heart's door and I invited Jesus in. You'd lift your hand and say, that's what I did. For the first time, Preacher, that's what I did. I asked the Lord to save me. Oh, if you have questions about your eternal destiny, please don't, don't leave this building. Don't leave this auditorium. Don't leave this property without it getting settled this morning. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Pastor comes, takes charge of the service. Yesterday, I was out with Marshall Wade. We went over to a senior community, and there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of apartments for seniors, and uh, there were seniors sitting out on the porch, and we just went around there, and we're talking to people. Came up to this lady, and uh, Mary Lamb, 
and uh, 82 years of age. She's from New Jersey, Brother Solano. New Jersey, oh my. Uh, talked about the revival and the fried chicken and talked about farm fresh chicken, Miss Diane. And she said, uh, Pastor, you've never tasted my fried chicken. It's much better. And I said, well, you can make it for all of us. He said, you'll never taste my fried chicken. I'm retired. And, uh, but then I began to talk to her about the Lord. Are you sure you'd go to heaven? She says, no. And I went through the whole plan of salvation. We're all sinners. Uh, the price for our sin is hell. Jesus paid that price. And she listened and listened intently and got to the point. I said, now, Miss Mary Lamb, would you be willing to trust Christ as your Savior so you can go to heaven when you die? And she looked at me and said, no. And, uh, you know, it's a decision she makes. It's like decisions we make. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you're one day going to have to stand before God. And listen, also, it's not just that, but you think about every decision we make. We have a decision to tell people about the Lord. We have a decision to go to revival tonight or not. And all of those decisions, just like Mary Lamb's decision to reject Christ, they matter. I want to encourage you to make a decision. Say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Revival tonight? Boy, it can be inconvenient for some of you, but it's be good for you. And as I was walking out of that complex right there with Marshall, I said, you know what? There's folks all around here that desperately need the gospel. And what we can do, and I'm going to figure it out, is we're going to take a van over there at 5.30 on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And I'm going to spend some time on Monday trying to round up some of those people and get them into church so there may be a Mary Lamb there, but by a different name, rather than rejecting Christ, we'll trust Christ. And, you know, we all can do our part and make a difference for this revival. Amen. Turn around and shake somebody's hand around you. And so I'm so glad you came today. So glad. All right. Uh, two things. We have Sunday school in 20 minutes. There's Sunday school classes going on all over the place. My Sunday school class meets in here. If you don't have a place to go, it'll be a blessing to have you. And uh, praise the Lord. Revival services tonight at 6 o'clock. You're getting that book, Shipwrecked. That'll be a blessing. Let's have a great week. And uh, let's have a great revival. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. And Lord, thank you for that gift of eternal life. When we read Luke 16, that rich man in hell, in those flames, and he did pray. He prayed for his brethren, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you help us to not be dry-eyed, but teary-eyed, Lord. Help us to realize that we have a chance to make a difference with people today, Lord. Lord, thank you for that truth right there, Lord. And I pray that you bless this revival. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.